I usually get up here and start out by saying how uncomfortable I am preaching on Easter, but today I'm happy. <laughs> Shouldn't be. Happy to be alive, happy to be with you. And, uh, and thank you for saying I didn't fire Chris, you know. <laughs> We've been, we've been texting back and forth this morning, and he said he's in Vegas at the Easter service led by a DJ. <laughs> dreads, you know, and I thought, maybe I should grow dreads. No, that's not right. <laughs> Didn't mean to get your hopes up, you know. Um, uh, the, the reason that it's unusual for me to be happy today and joyful is that uh, I'm one of those guys who... Uh, I would have loved that first Easter morning that uh, Damien read about in, uh, in the Bible. It wasn't uh, a great um, explosion of tulips and stuff that day. Um, yesterday, I uh, went by the, uh, the Everett Country Club, and they were having the meet the Easter bunny party. And, uh, and all these families and Grandma and Grandpa bringing the grandkids and everybody, and everybody's in pink, orange, yellow, and and lime green, basically, those four, and uh, packing out the place, uh, and I thought, yeah, they've got the Easter spirit, and, uh, but that's different than that first Easter morning, isn't it? The first Easter morning, uh, people weren't able to see what was happening. We look at it now, looking back at history, and go, oh, wow, that's a reason for joy. It's a reason for celebration. But they didn't have that perspective. And um, I think I told you some of my Easter experiences, which in my family were rather bizarre. But um, when I was really young, uh, my grandma Ruth um, always had the big dinner. And if I was lucky, I got to mash the potatoes. The only thing she ever said about me in my entire life was, you know, Johnny could really mash the potatoes. <laughs> so I got that going for me. You know? and, uh, but one year she had a, an Easter egg hunt out in the backyard. And I remember, I, was, I had the, the suit with the short pants, you know, and the little bow tie. And uh, I could probably still bring that out if we needed. But uh, uh, I had my little basket with the, with the fake grass stuff in it, you know, the plasticky grass. And my little basket was so filled with hope, and I went out, and pretty soon I came back just sobbing. I couldn't find a single Easter egg, not one. Uh, my little sister got two. I got none. the older kids were grabbing them, filling up their basket. I had nothing, and and Grandma Ruth looked at me and uh, in a way that a grandmother might do, and uh, said, "Well." I think that there's some out there still to be found. And I got that little glimmer of hope. And uh, I kind of saw her slip some things into her apron pocket, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we went out and she'd say, well, do you see one over there? And I'd look and look and I don't see anything. And she was, well, look here, you know? And then she'd kind of, you know, David Copperfield it, you know? And uh, kind of palm it and, well, how about here behind this uh, fern? Look there. No, there's nothing. Oh, my goodness, I found one. Well, that, that continued a few times until I was the happiest kid on earth. I had, like, three <laughs> treasure finds, and her teller apron pocket was empty. And, uh, and I thought about that, and I thought, you know, that reminded me of the church. Because um, so many times we feel like everybody else is, is understanding and getting it and... Uh, <coughs> are part of the action, and we are the ones who are sort of left out, and we don't understand, and we can't find it, we don't make sense of it, we can't see. And uh, and I think at that time, it's when we need the Lord to come down and say, okay, look, look under this branch. <laughs> Here we go. And, uh, you know, and, and in that first Easter, we, if you look at any of the Gospels, all four of them, uh, the Peter didn't. He ran. He ran. You know, he was the betrayer. He he uh, was out of sorts with everybody, and he ran to the empty tomb, and then looked in, shrugged, and walked away. <laughs> Went back to work with Donna. Started fishing. No Easter celebration for him. 
uh, <coughs> the, the, the women, the Marys, and everybody who came, you know, to uh, embalm the body. And they were worried because they're bringing the spices, but there's a stone in front of the tomb, so how are they going to get in there to embalm the body? And they're talking about that, and then they see what happens there, and they're told, go and tell the others. So they do. Isn't that they, do they do exactly what they were supposed to do. They went back and told the others, and how did the other disciples respond? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's stupid. I don't know what they're talking about. The sexism right there in the Easter message. They just didn't get it. And then, and then Mary, and we're told in one of the gospels, stayed and uh, was crying and everything and didn't understand what was happening and uh, comes up to Jesus and doesn't recognize him, thinks he's the gardener and so where'd you put him? You know, and, and, uh, and the gardener, Jesus, goes, hey, hey, it's me. She, she missed the Lord himself right in front of her. You know, you think, well, if Jesus appeared to me on Easter Sunday, I'd recognize him, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Now, I, I've heard a lot of sermons over the years, you know, way too many sermons. I've preached way too many sermons. But um, I have this thing. I, I need to tell you this, okay? It's kind of a disclaimer. And that is, I really struggle with um, phony stories, phony sermon illustrations. And uh, for years, I was a professor of homiletics, which is preaching at Fuller Seminary. And I would tell them, don't buy a sermon illustration book. And if your Aunt Lois gives you one for Christmas, throw it away by New Year's. Do not use them. And, and I got a finely tuned ear for uh, these fake stories. You know. Usually they're based on country western songs too. <laughs> <laughs> they did tie a yellow ribbon on the old tree, you know. And uh, but um, uh, about 15 years ago, I was uh, serving on a mission board, and we're down in, in L.A. And I uh, had a chance to hear uh, a great preacher, really a great preacher, um, Ken Ulmer, and his church is uh, uh, the Faithful Central Bible Church of Los Angeles. Cool name. And, he, and he's the pastor in South Central L.A. A few years ago, they bought the fabulous forum that the Lakers played in as their church. So they're doing okay, you know, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> the fabulous forum. Anyway, he, he had a, an illustration in his talk, and I sat there and went, wow, that's really a good illustration. Too bad it's not true. <laughs> you know, it's up smoke. And so I've thought about it over the last 15 years. He talked about a picture, you know, it's an old painting, a hundred year old painting uh, of Satan playing chess with this guy and having the guy checkmate and Satan was gloating and the guy just realized that it was all over, you know. So he tells the story about this painting. And I go, that's so obvious. You know, what a stupid, I mean, there's, Who's going to sit and paint a picture of Satan playing chess, you know? And uh, a few weeks ago, I started thinking, you know, you never did check it out, West Paul. So I decided to be an art historian, and I went researching. And guess what I found? Will, show us. There. <laughs> Ta-da! That painting's actually real. And uh, it's an amazing thing because... Um, the artist of Germany um, got the deal of his lifetime um, about 1825 or so. He um, was given the commission to uh, do the illustrations for <clears throat> Faust, about the man who sells his soul to the devil. Right? And he did 26 illustrations, and this is one of, one of the paintings. Ken Omer was not lying. I thought he was. And, and, and I love the, the look in Satan's eyes and as he has come to the end of the game and, and we now know his Faust, uh, unbelievably stunned that it's over. Didn't expect that. And uh, there's a... Uh, There's another part of this. Um, 
back in the mid 1800s, a few years after that was painted, in America, New Orleans, a young guy rose up, uh, Paul Charles Morphy, and he was a, a chess player. When he was 12, he beat uh, the European chess master, who was his name, in three games. You know, that's pretty good, you know. And then uh, in, uh, when he was uh, 20 years old, he went to New York City and won the United States chess title in New York City. Uh, when he was 21, um, Paul Morphy uh, went to, to Europe where every country he would play their chess master and, and mostly won. What happened was he went, we, turn this off now. Uh, he went into a museum in uh, in Germany, and they were having an exhibit of the 26 illustrations of the Faust uh, book. And he and a friend were there, and he came upon this painting and was drawn to it, obviously, because he was a chess master. And I say he was a chess master, he was dead. And uh, he knew the stuff, and so he was uh, watching the uh, painting, and his friend got bored and said, you, you know, see you later, I'm going to go look at the rest of the exhibit. And so his friend walked off and came back, and he was still there left again, <coughs> came back. I said, you ready to go? And he went, it's wrong, the painting's wrong. The painting is wrong. He got it wrong. It's not over. The king has one more move. <coughs> the king has one more move. <coughs> And Damien, who's the literate, literate one in our family, um, was telling me that actually in all of the accounts of Faust, he always had one more thing he could have done <coughs> that he didn't do, which was repent. The one thing he wouldn't do. But uh, Charles Morphy says, uh, it's not over. This painting is wrong. It needs, it needs to be repainted. Basically. And, I, you know, in thinking about that, you know me, I'm, I'm kind of a natural, not positive person, right? <laughs> and so it's really easy for me to get involved in things and then watch them deteriorate. Uh, you know, I start with disorder and then it deteriorates. Um, I start out slow and taper off, you know, that, <laughs> that's sort of the way I go. And, uh, and, and it's often that I feel like, well, nothing works, it's all over. I get there so fast compared to so many of you. Uh, you have much more faith than I do uh, for me. And, uh, and I get to the point where I go, there's nothing to be done. There's nothing to be done. And I need to hear it's not over. Why? Because the king has one more move. And throughout the Bible, we see that. I mean, you know, uh, Moses uh, takes the children of Israel, the whole nation, out of uh, Egypt, and uh, and they get to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea is blocking them in front, and the uh, Pharaoh's armies are coming to slaughter them from behind, and they're at the Red Sea, and 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 they're saying, but Moses, what were you thinking? Actually, in the Bible, it says. Why'd you bring us out here tonight? We could have just as well died back home. We didn't have to come all this way to die because it's over. But it wasn't over. Why? The king has one more move. And then there's David and Goliath. David, the young kid, shepherd boy, too small for the military uniform and armor. He gets out there and, and I can just imagine uh, Goliath and the Philistines yelling, checkmate, checkmate, I've got this one. Okay, no worries here. You know, sitting back kind of like Satan, right? And, 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 and instead, because David knew that the king had one more move. And then, Good Friday. Good Friday. Jesus arrested, beaten, humiliated, defeated, asking God, why have you forsaken me? Hung up on the cross, killed for our sin. 
then you drive off and put it into a tomb, sealed up. <coughs> Nobody could steal the body. It was over. And that's why those first disciples in every single gospel account are going, I don't get it. That's why Peter betrayed him. Everybody knew he betrayed him. He didn't belong anymore. He had the shame. And he runs in and he sees the empty tomb and he walks away going, I don't get it. It's over. But it wasn't over. Why? <coughs> The king had one more move. And that's why we're here worshiping today, right? That's why. Not because we need to cheer each other up over our uh, issues. Yeah, we can do that any Sunday. Not today. You know, this year, I've never been sick. And, then, and this fall, you know, three months, uh, I have a malignant tumor taken out and I can't do anything for three months and I'm literally I'm, I'm crying I, at one time I, didn't even I, was, I was crying in bed going I don't want this this is not what I want this is not how I saw my life being at this point and she's probably thinking well get over it you know <laughs> no, but she was very kind though and, and uh, it was not what I want and, and I thought it was over I thought, well, I'd, I'd already turned in my retirement for y'all. And some of you were thrilled about that. Some of you were nervous. But, um, but it wasn't over. Why? Because the king had one more move. That's why. And we can't see it at the time. We can't see it when we're in it. We can't see it when we're lying in bed trying to recover from a cancer surgery. And the, and the doctor's telling you, well, you still got cancer, but, uh, you know, get on with your life. What life? And then the... <clears throat> everybody's got stuff, right? Some of you have relationship issues, you have a, a love or marriage going wrong and you don't know what to do about it or somebody you care for the most is, is not responsive in the way that you need and you feel like your heart's being broken and, and there's nothing you can do and everything you've tried has failed and you can't get them to love you if they won't, right? You think it's over? But the king has one more move. We need to know that. <coughs> And it could be a physical health, it could be a inner turmoil, it could be an addiction that we carry and we feel like it, you know, I can't beat this, I can't beat this, it keeps coming around and, and we need to know the king has one more move. How do we celebrate Easter? How do we celebrate Easter? No matter what we face no matter what we're carrying with us from the past, of which I would bet in this room there's quite a bit. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to uh, raise your hand and tell me what you're carrying from the past, you know, because I don't want to stay here all day and write it all down, okay? <laughs> Let's just leave that between you and the Lord, okay? <laughs> yeah, we got stuff, you know, don't we? It would be so great to be free from that, but we feel like we're not going to get over it, right? We're not going to get over it, and, and, and we feel bound up from it and blocked and shame and guilt and all this stuff and it's just a failure reminding us and, and, and it, it's over. But it's not. Why? The king has one more move. That's right. That's exactly right. Thank you for remembering that because this I didn't remember. <laughs> that really, that helps me there just to know that one person got it and they're on the far side. <laughs> I'm going to just preach over here now. <laughs> Forget you people. <laughs> or maybe we got a fear about the future. I, I got so many of them, I stack them up all the time, you know. Uh, fears about the, what's going to happen here and what about this and what if that doesn't work out and what if what if it doesn't go as planned well nothing goes as I planned so I should be used to it by now right but but we, it, it, our life is fragile it may not be the way we want it to be it may not hold together uh, it may not work out the way we want and we think well that, why even go forward why it's all over 
but it's not over. You know why? I'm going to give them a chance. <laughs> why is it not over? <laughs> they came out of their coma. <laughs> Finally. Yeah. Slow, but we're not dead. <laughs> slow, but you're not dead. <laughs> the Bible says you are born into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You are born into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in regret. We don't have to live in... in uh, Anxiety. We don't have to live defeated. You were born into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That means it's not over. The king has one more move. We were born for something more than just the struggle. And when God makes his move, when God moves in your life, in my life, in the city, in the church, in this world, when God makes his move, you know what happens? Love wins. That's what happens. Love wins. And smug Satan that you saw in the painting, looking down going, hey, I got this, I got this covered. Oh, and I imagine him looking at me that way a lot of times. Hey, hey, Westfall, hey, I got him. Oh, yeah, I got, you know. Hope wins. When God makes his move, hope wins. And when God makes his move, there's grace. There's a lot of room. There's a lot of room for our issues. This Easter, you may think the game is up. You may think it's over. You may think you've tried everything. Nothing works. I mean, yet last night, this is my illustration, you know, I'm cooking in the garage, you know, because we've torn up the house, got the house. So I'm cooking in the garage, and I, I went to Fred Meyer, and I've got my microwave, and i got my uh, blender, and I've got my little toaster oven. 29 bucks for that. And last night, they knew what happened. The microwave went out. <laughs> One third of my cooking resources. <laughs> they went around, the light came on, and nothing got hot. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, no kidding, I went like this. Nothing works in my life. <laughs> <laughs> my life sucks. <laughs> that was more of the Greek translation. <laughs> Nothing works. That's a little thing. And you go, ah, I gotta get another one. You know, but, but I'm there trying to make dinner and it's not working. And I'll, what am I gonna do? Put the ribs in the blender? <laughs> and, and so many times I wanna give up. Just wanna give up. I remember the Sunday when we started the church in the, in the house uh, over at Edmonds and uh, and we're going on pretty good. We got like eight people, 10 people, sometimes 12 people. Oh man, we were going good. And uh, and then one Sunday night, we all gathered and there were two people. <laughs> and they weren't the ones who lived in the house. They decided to go out. <laughs> and I looked out at the vast congregation. <laughs> two people. <laughs> Shall we take an offering? <laughs> Man. And I thought, Harvard Church is over. It's done. This is the word I used. It is not sustainable ministry. <laughs> this is done. And the next week, I got a letter from the two people saying, we're not coming back anymore. This is not what we're looking for. <laughs> we're going back to big church. <coughs> I thought, it's, it's done. But you know what? It wasn't done. You know why? Why? Yeah, the, king the king had one more move, and now you're all here. Isn't that amazing? One by one by one. All these people who wanted to go to a church 
when you don't want to go to church anymore, basically. <laughs> the king had one more move, and I didn't know what it was. It was you. That's the funny thing. His answer, his move was you. <coughs> I think there's no stopping what God can do. If we just remember that it's not over. And why is that? I can't hear you. <laughs> why is that? Yes. So Lord, bless us with your love. Move in our life. Move in our struggle. Move in our relationships. Move in our pain. Move in our dis-ease. And bring your hope and your love and your grace and let us see you in a fresh way. We'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.